Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at South Pause. Um, this afternoon, we are operating on an eight-year-old Maltese that has a distal femoral fracture. Um, unknown trauma, probably was jumped on by another dog. Um, and so I can't easily post the radiographs to you, except that I did put it as the um, thumbnail on this video when I posted it originally. Uh, if you look at the radiographs as well, this dog had a previous tibial crest transposition for a patella luxation, which is unrelated to the current problem. So I'm doing a lateral approach to the stifle, and we're going to explore the stifle as well as look at the distal femoral fracture. Um, I'm going to try to look at the cruciate ligaments as well um, while we're in there. Um, just because there is some concern of the possibility of cruciate disease prior to this incident. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so you'll get a ding on your phone when we start live streaming again. We do have the live chat running as well, and if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them, and I'll try to answer them in real time. So, um, so we've got Oakland, California here. That's nice to see, although I think that it's far too late for you guys to be watching surgery videos in California right now. Um, so I haven't decided whether I'm going to use a plate or pins. It's kind of at that transitional zone between pins and plates. It's quite far distal, um, but but not, not as far as I like to see when I'm doing um, a, a cross pin technique. So we'll see what it looks like when I get in there. So this is the tibial crest down here. That's the patella right there. There's also a slight possibility that this is a pathological fracture because there was no specific trauma uh, uh, or not, a not known trauma related to the incident. But uh, looking at the radiographs, it doesn't look um, a lot like um, a pathological fracture. I can't see any evidence of bone destruction, lysis, anything like that. We do have the owners prepared that we may call them during the procedure and tell them that we need to convert to an amputation. And we've prepped, uh, prepped both the owners and the dog um, for that possibility. So just doing a lateral kind of parapatellar approach to the stifle and to the distal femur. Got some suction here, Joe. So that's the parapatella fiber cartilage right there. They're just cut through. And there's the distal femoral component down there. So there's a good view of the femoral condyles. I'm just cutting through that joint capsule there distally. Just section right over that. So this dog, I think, probably had a trochleoplasty as well. Yeah, I can see where the cartilage was cut. 
And I'm just going to try to get a look at that cruciate ligament. Can you suction right on the cruciate ligament? Yeah, so that cruciate ligament, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it looks completely intact in my opinion. All right, so here's the distal femur right here. This is the proximal segment of the femur. And then that's the distal segment down there. I think that it's probably far enough distal that I can use cross pins. That certainly is a much easier repair. Can I get a pointed reduction, a small pointed reduction force, it, please? I'll try to zoom in. Since it's perfectly centered, it should be easy to zoom in there. Yep. Uh, yep. Might be a little small. No, that, uh, that'll be all right. So we have hi from George, who's in New York City, CVA. You are definitely up too late because um, it's East Coast US. And Froz from India. I'm just trying to grab onto that segment, that distal segment, to get a better look at it. Again, making sure that there's no evidence of any cancer in there. I don't see anything grossly. It just looks like hematoma. Um, now, Joe, I'm going to have you suction while I just try to pick away some of this blood clot. See if we can get it to reduce and stay that way. So a lot of these distal femoral fractures really intercalate really nicely. Um, this one is almost a transverse fracture. And so it's not inert or um, innately stable. Let's see if I'd be better off putting a little plate on there. That would go on there nicely. So that one up there. not going to be the easiest fracture to repair. Um, I'm just going to extend my incision proximally a little bit more. And having these gelpies in here also can interfere with your ability to reduce the fracture. You have to remember that. Because that's going to shorten the effective length of the muscle by retracting, which is going to make the fracture want to collapse. So I'm just cleaning off some periosteum here. So the question about how the fracture occurred, again, not sure exactly. I um, think it was a big dog, little dog uh, interaction, um, but not aggressively. I think they were just playing. I'm 
you may do is just drive a pin up the center of it that I can remove later if I need to. Can I get a, an 062 pin, please? Thank you. So I'm just going to do a temporary fixation with a pin. Make it a little bit easier to assess. But again, it's not inherently stable like some of these guys are. So I'm just going up in the, to the, uh, all good. I'm just going up the center of the inner trochanteric fossa. Uh, sorry, inner condylar notch. Um, let me hold on to that just like that. Okay, so I've just come out up there. It's not perfectly reduced, I can do better. You can see how a single pin fixation is inherently unstable in rotation. And that demonstrates that really nicely. I'm just gonna move my point of reduction force it. Drive another pin from the lateral condyle. Okay, so now we've got two points of fixation that's much more stable. And I've got a more stability so then I can have a look at this plate and see if I think that it's appropriate. Pretty good. I'm 
just have a look up here approximately. Make sure that I'm on the bone all the way up. I'm not. That's on the bone there. And I don't want this part of the plate to be sticking out next to the groove. Extend my incision a little bit farther, approximately again. Question about how we determine whether it was caused by trauma. Um, and basically, it's just historical. Um, and there's a question about whether rush pin technique would be appropriate. So that's what we're doing here with these pins. Look, I think it would probably be okay, but this is an older dog. And so I'd be more confident if I could get a plate on there. It's just a matter of whether. So that's only getting two screws to get this distally. It's just such a far distal fracture. Um, I think my tendency is gonna to be to repair it just with pins. So I think that that's feeling very stable. I've got nice big pins in there. It's a pretty far distal fracture. I'm just worried that with a plate, um, I'm not gonna get enough screws distally. See how I go with this last pin. This one's a little bit harder. When you're going, for, see how the fracture is oblique. Let me just zoom out a little bit more. When the fracture is oblique with the distal segment, so I have less bone to work with down here. Can I get a home input? Oh, I've got one. Just retract on that, Joe, for me, please. Uh, just try to get that back in the field. I'm gonna have to go into the condyle but without being on the articular surface. So usually what I do is I go in first straight like this, get the pin seated, and then I'm gonna rock it up. That's going caudal. Let's miss the bone though, just here. So there's a question if one screw will be enough for the distal segment, and it definitely would not be enough. Um, so that's why I'm battling with how I'm gonna repair this thing. That's why I've decided to go with a rush pin technique rather than a, a plate. That looks really good though. 
Um, the other thing I could do would be to come down from that direction. Can I get an 045 pin, or an 054 pin, please? So I'm going to take a smaller pin and go from proximal to distal and try to seat it in that condyle without exiting through the cartilage. So I'm just going to come down like this. Uh, can I get a pin cutter, please? That's not the not the massive pin cutter. It's a little bit smaller than that. Uh, oh, look, I can probably use that one. That's fine. So this pin I'm going to pull out a little bit so it's not sticking out so far. And then I'm going to cut it flush and then hammer it in. Can I get a a hammer and a nail set. Do you know what the nail set looks like? It looks like a little pen, a big pencil. Yep. So I need a mallet and a nail set. I'm just gonna pull this back out a little bit more. And then I'm gonna cut it off as close as I can. And then I'm gonna tap it in. And a question about pins, pins and a plate. Um, and the plate that we had, we have a very small plate, and I just didn't think that it would fit properly with the angulation of that distal femur. Yes, yes. Angulation of that distal femur, I couldn't get a plate that was going to fit on there properly. All right, so then we're taking this nail here. I'm just going to tap that in. So just give me some counter pressure there. Just watch, Mike, because the, the pin's going to come out right in your thumb. Okay, so that's nailed in there. And I'll try to cut off a little bit of that pin. Close your, oh, yeah, cover that up. That's great. All right, so that's not sticking out too much. All right, and then this guy, I'm gonna cut a little bit shorter and then I'm gonna bend it. And then cut it off even shorter. Bent that over there, cut that off, and then I'm going to use my nail set to tap that around the back, just so that it's not going to impinge on the soft tissues as much. And then use this to bend this pin up as close as I can to the bone. So I'm using my suction tip. That's probably the best trick of the whole surgery. Grab onto that pin, please. Okay. And get that out of the way. And this guy up like this. And 
And the reason why I'm bending over the pins before I cut them is that I'm trying to prevent pin migration. Um, okay. Drop the patella back in place. We'll see how that feels. All right, that's pretty good. All right, so we'll go ahead and lavage this out. I'm happy with that. Let's get a gelpie in here. Can you get some 3 PDS, please? So there's a question about whether I'm using a suction tip to bend the pins, and the answer to that is yes. They are disposable suction tips. Um, otherwise, I think that you might piss off your central supply people. All right. So, and then the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to repair that parapatella fiber cartilage to make sure that that patella stays in place. So that's that structure, that bright white structure right there. Come over here to the parapetella fiber cartilage there. And we're going to do just little cruciate sutures to make sure that that stays in. Uh, so the patella luxation um, is only because I've, I've luxated it during the approach. There was a question about that. It did have a previous patella luxation. The patella is sitting right in here. Um, it did have a pretty previous patella luxation that was repaired using a um, tibial crush transposition and a trochleoplasty. Back. Oh, sorry, Steph. Just don't want to lose that. That's about 300 bucks worth of plate. I'm just going to repair the fasciolata. Just so we didn't lose it. Uh, 
Uh, and there's a question, are we going to use a narcotic patch? How much does this dog weigh? How much does it weigh? 7.1. So yeah, we'll use uh, either a 12 or part of a 25 microgram fentanyl patch. Thank you. So a question about range of motion. Uh, so there's no effect on range of motion here. Um, and we will um, recommend uh, physiotherapy in this guy, but we shouldn't really have any effect on the range of motion at all. I don't think I'm live streaming anything else today. Possibility of a splenic mass, but I, uh, Steph is probably going to have to come in and do that. Steph, if you're watching. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's probably, hopefully, it for me today. Thank you. Can I get some more three OPDS, please? And Stefania, we are going to uh, take post-op rides on this, please. So he'll have a fentanyl patch. He'll stay on a fentanyl CRI overnight. Um, no antibiotics. Sedation is okay, whatever you need. Um, trazodone or Domator or, or um, Acepromazine. And... No other charting. Um, yes, and please ice and do range of motion. Uh, 0 0.2? Uh, uh, 0.1. And there's a question. We, we are going to restrict his activity for about eight weeks um, until we get a post-op radiograph at that point, which is going to confirm that we've had healing of the fracture. Uh, rechecks at one week and two weeks. Uh, you have them on fentanyl as well as ketamine? Uh, stop the ketamine. Uh, so I'm not going to restrict his range of motion. I'm just going to restrict the dog. Um, so just um, uh, outside to go to the bathroom a couple of times a day for the next eight weeks. And we are going to do physiotherapy in the form of an underwater treadmill. 
um, uh, probably three times a week until he gets good function back. We have a physiotherapist up the road that we work with uh, who has a couple of underwater treadmills. I don't think so. No. Yes. Um, so good question. I don't like staples during closure and with a couple of different types of surgery, they've been shown to be associated with an increased infection rate. My preference is always intradermal sutures um, because then we don't have to worry about the dog chewing the stitches out as much um, and they don't necessarily have to come back to us for suture removal. Um, and so that is always my preference. Um, people are often coming from quite a distance to us and so um, and also our, our owners because they've paid a lot for surgery are pretty dedicated and if there's a problem they are going to come back um, to see us whereas in in general practice often they say that you should not do intradermals you should always do skin sutures to force the owner to come back uh, to see whether there's a problem or not and so I guess that's kind of the the crossover between specialist practice where um, we know owners are going to come back if there's a problem in general practice where um, if there isn't a problem, they may, or, or there may be a problem, but they might make, might decide not to come back. So um, that's why I like intradermal sutures. Next question is, will there be benefit of immobilization? Uh, we will not immobilize this at all. Um, we're trying to encourage range of motion for cartilage health, and you can reliably induce really severe arthritis by immobilizing a joint. And so anytime you can, you need to get the patient back to normal m mobility as soon as possible. And so we're going to uh, protect the repair, number one, by doing a good job, and number two, by restricting the patient um, after surgery rather than immobilizing the joint. And if what? I am not wearing loops. I should be. Can you tell by my suturing? I think people notice my suturing technique was so bad. That's why they're asking. 
I can always blame Joe. Just cut that guy there. Big guy? The big guy, yeah. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, and probably that's it for me for today. I've got a busy week next week, so I should be doing some streams. Um, and so I look forward to seeing you then. Hope everybody's having a good beginning of the new year. And um, if you're in Australia, not getting too hot. And if you're in America, not getting too cold. Um, and if you're other places, that you're just right. Anyways, thanks a lot for watching. And I will talk to you again soon. The dog will be in overnight, by the way. Um, with uh, We've got 24-hour care here, so I'll have vets and nurses with him for pain relief all night. Anyway, talk to you soon. Thanks a lot.